Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Susan Farnand and I'm the Executive Vice President for is and I want to welcome you to the first in is and new seminar series featuring the best student research from EI 2020. Over the next few months, we'll be showcasing research by students that led to best paper and best student paper awards received earlier this year. Before we begin, though, I want to take a couple of minutes to tell you about is and and the Electronic Imaging Symposium in particular. For those not familiar with is and the society is unique in that it brings together nearly an equal number of international researchers and practitioners from industry and academia. This makes a great place for students to showcase their work to prospective employers and for those in industry to learn about exciting developments in imaging research. ISNT spans imaging across applications from vision and capture through processing to output. Our conferences, court, courses, and journals offer a place to share the latest innovation with a network of others who have a love for and curiosity about the world of imaging. is and breadth is best found at the Electronic Imaging Symposium, where 20 conferences and more than 25 courses offer everything from AR, VR, and autonomous vehicles to big data, remote imaging, and mobile devices. Two great features about EI are the open access proceedings and the ability to submit a journal paper, which gives you a journal citation in lieu of a proceedings paper and still give a talk. EI can be quite overwhelming at times, but it is a great place to learn about the ways the fundamental science and technology explored in the academic setting can be incorporated into and improve our world. For students, it offers registration grants, a student young professional research showcase, a demonstration session, which is a bit like show and tell, conference best paper awards, and the ability to take courses for free. We encourage you to explore what EI has to offer and to submit relevant research. As part of our efforts to provide more value to students, we've launched this seminar series to highlight best paper research, allow people to learn about areas of imaging outside their subfield, and to provide a space to talk more in depth about a technology area. Our goal is to make the program interactive. So after today's talk, we'll open the floor, so to speak, to discussion and not just uh, questions and answers. We want everyone here to feel free to engage and be part of the conversation. To facilitate this, please take a moment to rename yourself on Zoom to your first and last name plus your affiliation. This will help us all to get to know each other better. We also encourage you to keep your camera on, especially after the talk during the discussion. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sander Klomp of Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands, where he is pursuing a PhD with a focus on efficient deep learning algorithms. Sander is going to be telling us about the work he is doing to help military personnel in conflict zones avoid improvised explosive devices. For this work, he won the 2020 best student paper in the Intelligent Robotics and Industrial Applications Using Computer Vision Conference at EI. Sander is using his focus on efficient deep learning algorithms to help detect a hidden explosive before it's too late. Sander? Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for the kind introduction. Um, and welcome, everyone else. I will, uh, I will share my screen, and we'll be going over uh, some PowerPoint slides with my uh, seminar. So everyone should be seeing my screen right now. Right, improvised explosive devices. So 
Improvised explosive devices are one of the main reasons for casualties in conflict zones in, uh, in modern warfare. And um, because of this, it is essential for the military to detect them on time. Now, being able to do so requires various techniques, but one of the things that you can do is doing it with cameras and with uh, artificial intelligence. Specifically, not just artificial intelligence, but convolutional neural networks, a subfield of that. Uh, hence the title of my, uh, my seminar, L Saving Lives with Convolutional Neural Networks, uh, Detecting Hidden Explosives Based on Suspicious Environmental Changes. Now this talk is actually based on uh, the paper that I wrote for electronic imaging. Um, and this was the title of that paper. So for those of you that want some additional background information, um, you can look it up after the talk and then uh, read all the technical details. In this talk, I'll mostly be focusing on uh, more of an overview and giving you a feel for uh, what it can do. So um, one thing that I want to say as well is in Zoom, you can uh, click the hand icon to raise your hand. If you have a question, um, I might be able to answer it during the talk and otherwise we'll have it uh, during the Q&A afterwards. So let's get into it. The problem, let's start with the problem. The problem is that roadside improvised explosive devices are extremely well hidden, usually buried in the roads um, or just next to the roads, uh, which makes them almost impossible to detect. Now, thankfully, these explosive devices are often accompanied by markers. And these markers, they can be absolutely anything. They can be uh, stacks of rocks, they can be a small fence post that has been moved. And the people that place these bombs, they, uh, they place these markers so they can sit at a distance and look with binoculars to see when a convoy passes by so that they can detonate uh, the explosive at the moment that it passes the marker. And these markers are detectable. Now the problem is we don't know what these markers look like. They can be literally anything. It could be a teddy bear for all we know. Um, and now the question is, is it possible to detect these markers reliably from a ground vehicle and do that in real time? Because we need to detect them before uh, we reach it. Now, this is a very complicated problem, but the solution is conceptually actually quite simple. So what we do is we take this uh, military vehicle and we mount a camera system on top of it with two cameras. Now, what we do first is as a military officer, you create a reference recording on your first patrol. And then on the next patrol of the same area, the system will find all the changes compared to this reference recording. So everything that has changed since the last time you did this route, which might be yesterday, might be a week ago. Um, now, of course, in an environment, many things can change. Leaves can blow, uh, sand might move a bit due to animals. Um, so there's quite a challenge in determining which changes are relevant and which changes are not relevant. And that is the conceptual solution. That's all there is to it. Now, I, I'm just going to show you some images um, of what it might look like when you're driving such a vehicle and you're looking through the windshield. It might look something like this. So in the previous patrol, you had this nice forest road, and in the current patrol, we have the same forest road, but a lot of things have changed, especially the weather. Now try to find the, uh, the markers that I've placed in this scene. I'll give you about three seconds. Bam, that was about as long as you had because the car is driving and uh, you had to find all five of them within about uh, three seconds. Now I'll be pretty impressed if any of you have managed to find all five of them. I expect most of you will find one, maybe two, maybe even three, but finding all five is, uh, is exceptionally challenging. So how can we, can we design a system that can do this automatically? Well, there's one thing that can already help us quite a bit, and that's a technique called registration. What it basically does is it takes two images and makes them appear as if they've been taken from exactly the same viewpoint. So that could look something like this. Now we've mapped these images on top of each other um, and all the pixels that could be mapped, you can see, and the pieces that are black could not be mapped on top of each other, for example, because uh, a tree was in the way in one of the two images and you just uh, can't find them. Now this definitely makes it easier to find the objects. Now I want to think, uh, make you think about how you searched for these objects in this scene. What you probably did was you looked for objects in uh, the current patrol, and then you try to see if those objects were also present in the previous patrol. Now what algorithms usually do, they, they look at individual pixels. They don't really work like a human would look at these images. So what I want to do instead is have an algorithm that can also look at these images the same way a human would by searching for objects first. So suppose such an algorithm existed, it might give you an output something, uh, something like this. So uh, here the blue color means something does not look like an object at all. And the red color uh, means it definitely looks like an object. Now, if such an algorithm existed, you could just subtract these two images to find the changes. And that is exactly what my algorithm does. And as you see here, all these objects that we saw previously are nicely highlighted in an image like this. And all the irrelevant changes, like the lighting changes, are 
no longer seen at all. So uh, before I explain how the system works, let's take a quick look at the requirements. First of all, of course, we want to be able to detect these, uh, these markers for the explosives, and it has to do better than uh, the baseline system that existed in the past. Secondly, we really need real-time performance because this is a system that needs to be deployed by the military uh, in the field. And if this doesn't work real time, it's completely useless because you need to detect the explosive before your vehicle reaches the explosive uh, for obvious reasons. Then there's some nice to have. Um, the registration that I just showed you of putting these images on top of each other and making them seem to have the same viewpoint, this sometimes has some errors. Uh, we also want the system to be robust to some of these errors. We also would like to understand when the new method fails and uh, when it does work well. Uh, thankfully, these goals have been achieved here. Um, so to very briefly check some related work, I won't go into detail uh, of any of these. You can ask about them uh, during the Q&A if you want. Uh, so change detection traditionally has been about uh, comparing images uh, just with some math and without any AI. And these are all techniques that you could use for that. Now this is also how all current image-based counter IED methods work. Uh, but instead, I'll be going into how we can use AI or convolutional neural networks to solve this problem. And that replaces almost all of the above techniques. And this is uh, quite capable of dealing with this ill-defined problem of finding suspicious changes, whatever that means, as long as you can provide it with enough examples of these types of changes so that it can learn by itself. So I'll only be going into detail for these convolutional neural networks because of time reasons. So first of all, let's take a look at a basic neural network and how that works. So suppose uh, we have an image of a car on the left and uh, we want to train some system to learn to recognize that this is an image of a car. Now what would happen is that you have this image on the, of a car all the way on the left and then all these blocks are just blocks of linear algebra. It's just mathematics. Um, and initially because we, uh, we don't want to design a system by hand and describe what a car looks like, we want a system that can learn what a car looks like. So initially all these blocks are completely random. And then as you pass this image of a car through all this mathematics, you pass it through more mathematics, then in the end, um, your system will tell you this is, well, maybe it tells you it's a bicycle. And then you tell the system, no, this isn't a bicycle. This is in fact a car. And then this correction uh, will be sent back through all this math to slightly change it in an automatic way. And the next time that you show the same system, an image of a car, it will, do better at uh, determining that this is indeed a car and it wasn't a bicycle as it thought initially. And if you do that with millions of images over time, then eventually you'll have a system that can learn to detect generic uh, cars, for example. Now in our specific case, we want to do a bit more uh, complicated things, not just detect whether something is a car, but we want to detect suspicious changes in an image. And we don't just want to detect the changes, we also want to know where these changes are in the image. Um, so for that, I will remove this last part of the mathematics so that we at least have some spatial information as well. And then I'll change this network all the way around just to make sure that we can use it for the purpose that uh, is actually uh, needed for this application. Um, I can go more into detail there if you have questions, but for now, let's just assume that I did that. And the updated problem statement then is, um, can change detection using convolutional neural networks outperform the traditional methods? Um, and then I made several design choices. So first of all, I knew that was, I was going to use a convolutional neural network, um, but I needed location information, not just classification information. Um, and for that, I changed my architecture a little bit to have something that is called an encoder and a decoder, which basically just gives you location information at a pixel level, instead of only giving you a label for an image. Um, and the reason that I used a second technique, which is called uh, Siamese network, is because I want to compare two images. I don't just want to look at a single image and say whether it contains something or not. I want to compare an image of the past of the previous patrol with an image of the current patrol. And that's where the Siamese network comes in. And then with a similar block scheme that I showed you uh, previously, it will look, now look something like this. Um, so here again, we have all these blocks of linear algebra um, trying to extract features from an image. So in the very low layers, this might check where horizontal lines are or where vertical lines are, very, very simple features. And as you get deeper, it will extract more and more abstract information like basic shapes and eventually something uh, that would describe a suspicious change. And these blocks on the right, as you see, they go bigger and bigger again. The only purpose of these blocks is to increase the resolution again in which you're looking. So um, 
if you're extracting these abstract features, at some point your image resolution will become very small from a very high resolution 1920 pixel image all the way to only 120 pixels down at the bottom. And then this part upsamples it again to a high resolution image so that we can exactly pinpoint where these suspicious changes are located. Now what's most interesting here is not so much the encoder. Sure, we can make it efficient because we need it to be real time, but I won't go into detail here. It's also not this decoder, which only uh, increases the resolution. Again, you can do it efficient, but that's not too interesting. It's mostly about this loss block at the end because this loss block, uh, it computes the signal that is required for this network to learn. So basically what this block does is it computes how well the network is doing and then it sends this signal back all the way through this lin linear algebra so that um, this network can update itself to learn, let's say. Um, and what it needs for that is something called crown truth. So something you as a human provide to tell it what are the things that it needs to detect and which things it can safely ignore. Um, so this function that I use here to uh, compute this backpropagating signal is called the contrastive loss function. And here's where we get a little bit of mathematics, but I won't really go into detail unless you ask me in the Q&A. The basic contrastive loss function looks like this. Um, as I said, I won't go into details here because it's probably too in depth, um, but what it effectively does is imagine that you can see an image as just a point. So for example, this black point is an image. Um, and this black point is another image, the, the new image. So this is the, the previous patrol, this is the current patrol. Now suppose we know that there is no changes in this image, then what this loss function does is it tries to pull these two points towards each other. It tries to make the distance as small as possible, distance of zero. That's one case. Now in a different case, we might have two images that have changed instead of those that have not changed. And what this loss function then does is it tries to push these two points apart so that the distance becomes larger until at some point the distance is large enough um, that, that you're satisfied with this distance. In my case, this is just a distance of one, it's kind of arbitrary. Now what this means, it is if you feed images to this network, if nothing has changed, it will just give you a distance of zero between two points. And if something suspicious has changed, it will give you a distance of one. And you can just directly use this distance between the images to determine whether something has changed in your image or not. Now for the details, I have several more slides here. So you'll see the slide number in the bottom left uh, jump quite a bit soon. Um, and then you eventually get an equation that looks something like this when you update it uh, to make it better for this specific purpose. Feel free to ask questions during the Q&A. There, we jump on nine slides ahead. Um, now we've defined all the important components here, but what we're really interested in is seeing how it does on real world data. So what you need for that first is data to train your network, to have it learn what is suspicious and what is not. And what I did for that is I recorded eight videos, uh, four sets of two videos, a historic one and a live one, um, and then manually placed objects in the environment and annotated those with uh, drawing some red bounding boxes around it. Um, and then you use this information to train your network. You show these images thousands of times to your network and eventually it will learn by itself what are suspicious changes and what are not. Then when you've done this, usually when you're an AI researcher, you want to verify whether your system will work on data that it has never seen before. Because of course, when you deploy the system in the real world, you'll always be looking at images that the network has never seen before. So because of that, I created a test set of videos that was significantly different. So instead of just forest environments, I now had some asphalt roads as well. Um, and I had a dune environment, just two different environments that you might encounter in the real world, just to test whether the system is working. And then you start experimenting, seeing whether your network indeed generalizes to these unseen images. And one form of generalization is generalizing to different domains. So what that means are different environments. Uh, what that means is if I'm in a dune environment, uh, will it detect small shifts of sand as suspicious changes because it's never seen that before? Or does it indeed learn to ignore these changes in environments that it's never seen and still detect uh, the suspicious ones? Then there's a different type of generalization that's across the type of ob objects that you're searching for. For example, you can train the network by showing it bottles and cans. Uh, as, as suspicious changes, but then it might still want to detect uh, a teddy bear because it could be literally anything. Um, and then we'll see how well it does there. Finally, I'll compare a bit to the state of the arts in, uh, in some numbers, uh, see how well it does. Let's start with the generalization. 
So in this case, we're seeing two images of a building of a previous patrol and a current patrol. And what happened here is this dumpster that was at the back of the building here has been moved to the front. So that's a change. Now this network has never seen a building before. It has also never seen a uh, brick roads before. It has only ever seen forest environments. So what we can expect is that it goes a bit haywire on the uh, object detections on this building because all of the things kind of look uh, out of place because it's only used to forest environments. And indeed that's what happens. So lots of parts of the building are detected as being potentially uh, an object. But thankfully, we weren't just looking at single images, we were comparing changes. So if we now also use this change detection part of the network, we can still subtract these images. And you see that most of these changes um, are suppressed and are correctly suppressed. And here in the back, we indeed see this dumpster that was removed in one image. And here we see the dumpster that was placed in the other image. So these are indeed the changes. Uh, and again, this is in a scene that it has never seen before. So that's quite nice. Now something else that we can do is look at the kind of changes uh, that we saw previously. So what we saw, uh, what elicited a high response for looking like a suspicious object was, for example, this small white block on, on front of the building, uh, this door here, this little branch. But all of these have been nicely canceled out by the change detection part of the network, where it sees that this was already present in the previous frame as well, so I can ignore it. Then again, the dumpster is indeed detected correctly, and the removal of the dumpster is as well. Um, then you can also do some extra processing afterwards. We're only interested in objects added to the scene because these markers are always added. So we can filter it a bit and remove everything that was uh, removed from the scene instead, because that's also a change, but it's not a change that we're interested in. And then it will look something like this. Okay, so apparently we can generalize over environments, but can we generalize over object classes? So suppose uh, we have several different object classes. We can have some uh, bottles and cans, we can have some blocks, and we have completely arbitrary objects. Now, what would happen if we would only train the network with detecting bottles and cans, and then try to, for example, uh, detect a change of a dumpster? Well, it turns out, as you saw in the previous frame, that this kind of works, but it doesn't nearly work as well as when you're also using uh, representative changes in your training set as well. Um, so basically the conclusion here is what is the conclusion of almost every uh, AI network is if you gather more data, your performance improves and the more your data is representative of the actual changes that you're trying to detect, the better it works. But still, the important part here is even if these objects have never appeared in your training set, this network will still have a chance of detecting them, which is already quite nice because most um, AI networks cannot do such a thing. Now, something else that we can do to improve the variety of our data without spending weeks and weeks uh, placing objects in actual forests is trying to use some artificial data. Uh, for example, using Photoshop to blend a random object into a scene. Um, there are several different ways in which you can do this. You can just directly copy paste an object into a scene. You can blur the edges a bit to make it blend in slightly better. Uh, and there's other um, blending methods that you can use to blend it in even better. Um, in this sense, you can use artificial objects to train even if you don't have um, real data available. Now, I do have to say that this works far less well than gathering actual data, but it's a good last resort if you know that certain types of objects uh, will be suspicious changes, but you don't have the capacity to make real recordings yourself to teach it to the network. You can just use artificial uh, blended objects. Uh, and then it will look something like this. So as you can see, the blending doesn't look perfectly natural. Uh, but the network can still learn something from it regardless. Okay, just a quick comparison to the state of the arts, um, as you will do with any research project that you do. Um, so what you see here is a graph with on the y-axis on the left side some score where the higher is better and a one is a perfect score where you detect everything. Then you see several colored bars for several different methods and each color bar represents a different training set. For example, this is one video, uh, this is another video, this is another video, and green is a video with very difficult to detect objects, which is why the scores of all the systems are lowest on the green set. Then the dashed line here is how fast the algorithm runs. So the higher that is, the faster the algorithm runs, and somewhere about 10 FPS would be fast enough to be considered real time. So this is actually my network, and um, these are two other state-of-the-art networks that I tried on my same data set. And the first thing that we see is that on all of these videos, it works uh, significantly better. Uh, and that's a good thing. 
Sadly though, it's still kind of expensive compared to the baseline. The baseline network that did not use AI was uh, quite a bit faster and did achieve this real, uh, real time uh, threshold, while our own network did not achieve the real time threshold yet. But then it turned out you can do a lot of optimizations on AI to make it a lot faster. Uh, one thing you can do is uh, using, well, floating point 16 numbers instead of floating point 32 for whoever has heard about that. Um, and there's all kinds of optimization libraries that you can use. Now, if you do that, you can actually boost the performance here to over 20 frames per second for this network, which drags it into the real time uh, and actually applicable range um, of research. And that's why I'm also glad to say that this September, the Ministry of Defense is actually, of the Netherlands, is starting uh, a project where this will actually be used. So to conclude, this new architecture definitely improves the robustness of an existing uh, IED change detection system, and it does so in real time. Um, it can actually also be applied for general change detection. It's not just limited to IEDs because the concepts are still valid. It's also applicable to static camera setups. Um, if you don't want to drive a vehicle, but just want to have a camera on the side of the road. And one application that I've used this for is to see uh, if people were littering on a highway. So you have a static camera and you can see whether people are throwing garbage out of their window uh, just by detecting the changes uh, in the, at the side of the road. Now in the future, what is most important is making these results explainable because an artificial intelligence system is kind of a black box. You input an image and you get some outputs, but you have no idea why the network is detecting what it's detecting. And the main question of the Ministry of Defense is how can you explain us when this system will work and when it won't work? And that is also what my future research will be mostly about, making results explainable. With this, I hope to eventually save some lives in the future. And as I said, it's good news that this will actually be used by the Ministry of Defense. So uh, that seems like a reliable possibility now. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's go to the Q&A session. I'm curious to your questions. Any questions, any input? Maybe some of you see applications of a system like this in, uh, in the real world that I have not discovered yet. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Hi, yeah, hi, Jing Zhang. Hey, hi, Sondo. Uh, well, first of all, nice presentation. Um, so one thing I, I always wonder when I see uh, these neural networks is how do you decide on a loss function? Because there are so many. Uh, well, how, how do you go about with that? How do you tackle that problem? Okay, so in, in this specific case, uh, there were several properties that were really nice to have. Um, First of all, when you're comparing two images, your options are severely more limited than when you're just trying to use a neural network on a single image, because the amount of research that has been done on comparing images is, is much, much smaller than the research that has been done on uh, analyzing a single image. Um, so in that sense, I didn't have too much to choose from. Um, but if I go back here, let's see. Um, the loss function. So usually you have several properties of a loss function that you, uh, that you really want it to have. In my case, I wanted it to be able to uh, handle don't care labels. And the reason for that is when I'm labeling an image with things that are suspicious changes and things that are not, um, as you saw previously, you have these weird black parts of the image where the registration uh, fails. So these black parts. Um, these black parts hold absolutely no information. And I want my loss function to be able to handle that. I want it to be able to ignore these black regions. And that already narrows down the search a little bit. Um, something else is when you're dealing with finding changes, um, as I showed before, uh, comparing two objects, there's only a limited number of ways that you can go about that. And I think even if you change this loss function uh, to a different one that still allows you to compare two points, it's, it's just perfectly fine. Um, there's no reason that this exact loss function will give you the optimal result. It just gives you one possible result. Um, as long as your loss function knows how to compare two points in, uh, in this case, in Euclidean space. 
Okay, interesting. And do you think that um, so one possible application for this technology could be in uh, self-driving cars, uh, in the sense that um, think of uh, self-driving uh, cars in urban areas, uh, where um, how should I explain it? Uh, for example, let's say Google uh, Google Maps is uh, doing a tour around the city to check whether uh, any new uh, um, traffic boards have been added to the to the street. Um, is, is that a possible use case for this technology, or is it over engineered, so to say? Uh, uh, if if you if you apply this technology for that use case. It could definitely work because if I look at um, this network, the one from Sakurada, um, it was actually used to determine the damage after a hurricane. So very big changes in an environment. So they made pictures of a city beforehand and then they made pictures of the city after a hurricane and they tried some automated methods to estimate the damage that the hurricane caused. Now these are massive changes in the environment compared to the very small changes that I have in my case. But as long as you're comparing changes, these, these types of networks can do that. So definitely for something like detecting whether traffic signs have changed on Google Maps, you, you could use it. Um, whether it's an over-engineered solution, yeah, that's more opinion-based. Um, personally, I would love it if there would exist a network that could just really emulate human intelligence, but we're just not there yet by a long shot. So for now, we're limited to these networks that are trained for one very specific purpose, and then they do quite well. Um, so in that sense, you almost need to over-engineer to something like that to get uh, acceptable results for the time being. Yeah, you might want to send a, send a message to the Google Maps team. Might <laughs> be an idea for them. Huh? Uh, one final thing then, um, you were talking about the hurricane uh, damage. Yeah. Um, do you think this technology could be used? And I, I, I do understand that it might be difficult to find annotated data for this, uh, but uh, for um, uh, detection of life under um, uh, under you know, the, the scraps of an earthquake. Yeah. Um, do, do you think it could be used for that, or is that too hard to see uh, visually? Yeah, there are two points that you very rightly already mentioned yourself. First of all, um, these networks work by having uh, a lot of labeled data available that it can use to learn. Uh, and creating labeled data of people buried under rubble um, might be a bit of a cruel thing to do to people. Um, often though, you can create proxy problems as they're called, which is a, a problem that is kind of similar but easier to gather data for. Uh, I'm not sure if something like that would exist for trying to detect people under rubble, uh, but I can imagine that people can come up with proxy problems to use to train a network to in the end actually do something like that. Uh, the second point that you mentioned, whether it's possible to see, see visually whether these people are indeed underneath the rubble. Um, the short answer is probably not. Uh, the slightly longer answer is a bit more hopeful because you might not be able to see it with RGB imagery, uh, but these kinds of networks are also very, very suited for uh, infrared imagery. And someone who's buried under rubble is quite likely to leave, for example, a heat stain on the image because there's some heat being generated under the rubble because of the person that's there. And I can imagine that something like that might be detected by a network. So then you would just need a different camera. Right. Yeah, it's uh, it's super interesting how good uh, these neural networks are at pattern detection. As long as you can think of a of a good use case, it seems yeah. the sky is the limit. Um, yeah, that's all of my questions. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the questions. They were interesting. So, any other inputs? Maybe um, someone. Yeah. Saunders, is this operating um, almost entirely on uh, spatial information, or is color information being used? Um, color information is also being used, which is actually one of the weaknesses. Uh, one of the tests that I did was uh, trying to make the colors more natural. So, uh, many of the objects in this uh, in this setting are kind of brightly colored which makes them more easy to detect. 
And if you change the colors of the objects to something that looks a lot more natural, like uh, the colors of leaves, kind of camouflaging the objects, it becomes a lot more difficult to detect the objects uh, using the system. Um, thankfully, um, the reason that these markers are placed is that um, these people that place the explosives want to be able to see from a distance when a convoy passes the marker. So the marker does have to be visible to a human, at least. So that gives it some constraints. Um, so as long as the marker is quite visible to a human, the system is also quite good at detecting it. Okay, so if if uh, the application changes in the the uh, the marker or what's being uh, looked for is more subtle, then um, that may change performance. It, it definitely may change performance, um, but as I said the kind of markers that we expect people to use uh, are always going to be reasonably visible because that's the reason that they place these markers. Um, something else that I did, which is a slightly different use case, uh, was trying to detect, detect the digging marks itself. So when something is buried, usually you can see that there was some digging because the earth is disturbed. Um, and that's also a change. So if you train with that kind of data, it also becomes quite good at detecting digging marks. Now the problem of detecting just the digging marks is that animals also leave quite a lot of digging marks, so you'll get quite a few false positives. Yeah. Uh, I have one question. Uh, do, do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you, David. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, how, how does this system uh, identify uh, how suspicious the marker is? What if somebody puts uh, some false markers intentionally to distract the system and then conceal the real marker somewhere else? So yeah. can it identify that there is something that uh, is, uh, I don't know, like for destruction only? Yeah, that's, that's going to be really, really difficult because, of course, the people that place these markers could place them all over the place. Um, and that's also one of the main issues that the Ministry of Defense has with it, that it is quite easy to counter this system just by uh, using a truck full of empty cans and dumping them all over the road. Um, so yes, for now, that will uh, kind of cheat the system. Uh, what I do want to do is combine this digging mark detection that I mentioned before with the markers that you will try to search for both a digging mark and a marker at the same time, which should improve the reliability. Uh, because then they would also have to dig random holes all over the place, and then it becomes a matter of effort versus uh, how well it conceals their actual motives. Yeah. But a very good point. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I hear you. Yeah. Well, nice talk anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you um, you used I suppose the registered registered images on your videos? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Did you measure the impact of uh, registration or on your measures? Or yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, for this data set, let's see if I can find it. This data set here, what you see is uh, one that's called small misalignment and large misalignment. What this actually means is that in the small misalignment case, uh, a vehicle was driving the exact same path. And in the large misalignment case, um, the second patrol had a five meters offset, which is quite large. And because of the five meters offset, the registration was much, much poorer. Um, and the performance is still reasonable, even if the registration results are really poor um, because these are this uh, orange bar and the, the yellow bar. So the yellow bar is only slightly lower than the orange bar, even though the registration is getting really, really large errors of up to 20, 30 pixels uh, in that case. Yeah, so definitely the performance deteriorates if your registration is really bad, but that's to be expected. But the performance still is, uh, is quite okay, I would say especially if you consider these other networks, 
that uh, haven't changed the loss function at all. And you see that if the registration is destroyed, their performance just goes almost to zero. Okay. Yeah, so um, that was one of the important parts, yeah. Okay, and is registration is made in real time also? Or? Made in real time, yes. Real time, okay. Yeah, and uh, the reason that we can do that is basically because we have a very big uh, computer in the back of the vehicle right now. Um, it's running uh, two Titan RTX cards at the moment. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit extreme, of course. We want to move to an integrated solution. Um, and if I look at how fast just this network is, um, it's getting pretty fast now. So this is also on an RTX Titan. Um, before I did any optimizations, it could do like four frames per second. But uh, after optimizing it, uh, it, it goes to 20. And because the system only makes uh, one picture every meter, um, you don't really need to process at 25 frames per second uh, to be real time. You only need to do like 10 frames per second because the vehicles don't drive that fast in a conflict zone. Um, so there's quite some room left for going to smaller hardware um, if you've optimized the, uh, the algorithm sufficiently. Okay, thank you. Maybe some people still uh, have questions on the ethics side of things, for example, because I usually see people when AI is mentioned um, on the ethics of, of data and the ethics of uh, trying to gather huge data sets, which might include people, which is an interesting subject. And if others have comments, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, um, it doesn't have to be a question. It could be a comment or a thought on other uh, um, ways this could be used. So maybe if I give some additional examples of what people are using change detection for, you'll also be inspired. Um, so what change detection is used for a lot is for um, satellite imagery, uh, for example, to determine whether uh, the rainforests are declining or not. So then you take satellite imagery of the same region every single time, and then you check uh, whether the, the forest region is declining or, or growing. That's one thing that you could use it for. Um, something else that I already mentioned is um, if people throw garbage out of their window in a car, you can check next to the road whether uh, objects are appearing next to the road and then you can link it back to people throwing the garbage out of the window. Um, as I said, the hurricane, uh, see how much damage a hurricane has caused. Um, what people are also using it for is in subway stations uh, to see if someone leaves a bag unattended. Um, it's also being used in museums for the same reason. See if people are leaving things behind in a museum that should not be there. Um, yeah, maybe that gives you some ideas of, uh, of other applications that this could be useful. And I know of uh, an application similar to your hurricane where um, it was used to find people who were on roofs of houses um, waiting to be rescued. So. Yeah, that would be a very, very nice application as well. With satellite imagery. Wow, yeah, that's really cool. And what about autonomous driving? Can it be used there? Like if a car has uh, videos from previous cars and then detects something really strange, changed. So can it help the autonomous driving process? Yeah, I think that's quite an interesting idea. I. I wouldn't see a direct application um, just as a main system, but as a redundancy system, I could imagine that it works uh, quite well because for example, if you know that there was always a traffic sign somewhere and someone knocked over the traffic sign by hitting it with a truck, um, then at least your system could say, hey, wait, but I, I, I know there was a traffic sign here. It's now no longer here. Maybe you should drive carefully because um, now you're not using the right parameters anymore. The, the situation has changed that could be useful, but then more, as I said, as a redundancy and not as a main, uh, main system. Yeah, just as an additional layer of security, just yeah. more. Or um, 
a particular example that I can think of is is if you're um, backing out um, from a uh, it, like a driveway or someplace where uh, um, you frequently back out of that same driveway looking for things that that weren't there um, in in previous days that might be helpful. Yeah, then it could also be a redundancy system for right. something like a radar. Uh, if the radar fails, then yeah, definitely. Okay, just out of curiosity, is anyone in the chat uh, working with convolutional neural networks themselves? Yeah, I see Alexandre yes. nodding. Yes. So, so what do you use them for mostly? Uh, I'm working on segmentation and I'm using unit-like architectures. Ah, cool. Yeah. I'm also doing something similar for different projects for the fans, trying to segment indoor uh, buildings to try to come up with an automatic uh, map while you're walking through the building, something like that. Um, yeah, segmentation is also a really cool field. You can do lots of useful things with that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's easier to do than classification, but depending on data sets, I presume. Yes, I, I consider the network architectures themselves to be slightly easier, um, for example, compared to object detection, because you don't need all these weird tricks with bounding boxes, you can just directly use pixels. Um, but getting the labels is, uh, yeah, having someone draw on an image every single pixel of a certain class just takes ages. And I'm working with someone who is working with uh, Siamese network on uh, uh, color changes, where the color changes, but the, the spatial information is the same. Okay. Um, and, and what's the application? What are they using that for? Um, just uh, understanding uh, right now, um, it's basic research. Can, can just a color change be detected? Okay, yeah, fair enough. And, uh, and the level of the change. Yeah. So the change can certainly be detected, but um, how, uh, understanding how big that change is is, is uh, more of the question. Yeah, but it's also kind of a matter of opinion, I would say. Um, especially um, in, in, in my case, whether something has changed really depends on what military operator you ask it. So sometimes uh, someone will say, yeah, this digging mark, it's really, really suspicious. And then another one says, no, it's not at all. And then I also don't know what to say to my network. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, with color, it's, it's uh, not necessarily opinion, but it certainly is perception. Yeah, definitely. And uh, perception is different for different people, certainly. Anything else anybody wants to add? Any questions, comments? Yes. If not, I think we'll uh, thank our speaker for uh, a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you. Learned a lot. Um, was, uh, and I think others will agree. Um, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm really happy that you were the one to uh, lead off this series. I think uh, that uh, gave others some ideas of, of uh, what to expect in, in seminars to come. And, uh, and hopefully uh, everybody will uh, join us for more of this series because it's, uh, I think, a really uh, valuable resource. I'll definitely be taking a look to the other presentations myself as well. Good to hear. So maybe everybody can unmute and, and just say thanks and maybe. <laughs> yeah, remote uh, presentations are always awkward <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Thank, Thank you. you.